Little Ponies and Cabbage Patch Kids. Examine with horror the gem embedded in your stomach. Empty all the monsters out of your pockets. And wonder, do the bears really care? <laughs> because it's time to talk to all to me. All the things to get you. That was it. It took me a second. You 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 broke it down enough that you really had to think about it. That was really good. Cuz I was thinking when you said bears, I was thinking Berenstain bears, but you went for Care Bears instead. No, no. It was it was good. Welcome back. I am Omen Say and I am Nick McGill. Together we are Feckless Moans. And this is Talk Told to Me. A hot and dusty recess play explosion in which teenage mutant ninja turtle Nick and off-brand moonshoe omen <laughs> will derive as much pleasure as possible out of each and every track that Masters of the Universe rock band Jethro Tull ever produced. Yes, track by track, album by album, we will see how high we can bounce Martin Madball's bar, arrange and rearrange the furniture of David Polly Pocket Peg, and see... If Mark Craney can both spell and speak. All with the hopes that Ian Atari Anderson will let us jam one more cartridge into him. Into, into his slot? Into his flute slot. This might be my favorite opener. This That was so good. Did you just have a bunch of flashbacks? I kind of did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I went to, uh, so we had our oh, quick, quick anecdote anecdote <laughs> we went to uh after opening night we went to a little local place in tampa and it is a it's called a it's called gen x and it's an 80s and 90s themed oh my goodness drinking establishment and when i tell you that every time i turn around i had just insane flashbacks there was like there was like a like a britney spears trapper keeper <laughs> <laughs> i mean i mean the whole thing was was an amazing trip down memory lane. What saddens me is the rest of your cast probably thought it was quirky and and nostalgic and retro. retro yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, there's where I left my pogs. <laughs> I've been missing those. I want to know, what does an off-brand moon shoe do? Like if you jump Not too much, hard, Nick. does it explode and like you lose <laughs> a leg? Uh, well, well, strap me on and find out. That's ooh, terribly exciting. Wow, that was Nick. that was a heck of an opener. It's it's been has it been like two weeks since we recorded an episode, Omen? It's it's been roughly a fortnight. Uh, yeah, I've been I've been um, I've been hot in the in the pursuit of opening my show, A Clockwork Orange, at uh, at the Tampa Straz Art Center. By the time you hear this, it will have been closed, probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I got a, a review. He did. He got a a a, a smacking review for the, for the first time ever. I got a review instead of instead of talk tall to me getting all the reviews. That's true. Yeah. If you are interested in the review of of Omen Said in a Clockwork Naranja, uh, go ahead and, and jump into the uh, the the show notes. We've got a, I've got a free there if you want to check that out. And if you have a time machine, go back in time and come see the show. That's it. Also, also try to do that. Yeah. Nick, speaking of a show, we have one to do right now. And before we do that, we have a lot of correspondencies to read. That's true. We do. Because we don't have much about A or the song itself preamble, we're going to try to knock out some, some reviews and emails for everybody. So we're going to start with emails. <clears throat> Your emails, sir. We begin with an email from Dave C. C, as in critter. <laughs> no, not C, as in North Sea oil. Mm, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Subject: My jump start. Message: Once upon a time, in the long ago fabled summer of 1988. My family were taking a trip to my grandparents' home in Kentucky for a week's vacation. Being a stereotypical 16-year-old, I sat in the back of our van with my headphones on, listening to the radio. 
I scanned through the stations and landed on Cincinnati's WEBN, where I heard an intoxicating melody with a flute. <laughs> I figured out the song was called Farm on the Freeway, an apt title since we were headed to my grandparents' farm and we were indeed on a freeway. I had no idea who the song was by, but filed it away in my memory for future reference. Flash forward a couple of years to Christmas at my parents' house in maybe 1990 or 91. The rest of my family was off doing other things, so I decided to play games on the computer and listen to the radio. This time, another Cincinnati station. 94.9, The Fox. I have no idea what the occasion was other than a lazy DJ working on Christmas, but they played the entire Thick as a Brick album. Wow, I was blown <laughs> away, but again, I had no clue what band it was. Even further down the road, in possibly 94, a friend had gotten a box of records from someone he knew and left them at my house to pick through. In the box was a beat-up copy of Aqualung by Jethro Tull. I had heard of Jethro Tull in high school, my history teacher had referenced the title song for some reason, and I didn't think I'd ever heard any of the music. I put it back in the box. Oh. A couple of weeks later, I was driving home and got stopped by a train. Train. It looked like I would be there for a while, so I turned the radio up and leaned back. As the next song began, a cool bluesy piano started up, then a guitar came in and the instruments started trading licks back and forth. Then my mind was blown as I heard Locomotive Breath for the first time. Hey, I just realized that I was stopped by a train for that song. This time, the DJ came on and said it was Jethro Tull with Locomotive Breath from the Aqualung album. Wait a minute! Wasn't that sitting in a box in the hall? I wasted no time in putting it on the turntable, curious to see what else they had to offer, and was not disappointed. I especially enjoyed Mother Goose and Wondering Aloud. Then, I flipped the record. I have to interrupt here and let you know that I grew up in a Christian home and attended a Christian school through ninth grade. Even though at this point in the story I had gotten past a lot of the dogma that had been piled on me, the scripture on the back of the Aqualung album gave me pause. What was up with that? I wasn't sure whether this was pro-God or anti-God. For that matter, I wasn't sure where I stood either. I didn't mind the overall love one another message of Christianity, but I had just been beat over the head at the Christian school I had attended. I loved one side of the album, but the titles of Psy 2 made me hesitate. Well, locomotive breath is there. I guess we'll see. And the needle found the groove of the second side. From my god through wind up, I was dumbfounded. Had Ian Anderson been through the same things that I had? It felt like Wind Up, in particular, was written specially for me. Thanks to the library, pre-internet, I found out that all the songs I had heard earlier in my life were all from the same band, and I set about maxing out my credit card <laughs> to obtain every album I could find. I got to see them live in 95 in Cincinnati, where they blew Emerson, Lake, and Palmer off the stage. It was an amazing show. So that's my story. Thank you guys for an excellent show about an excellent band. I think I have some stars around here that you may want, so I'm off to iTunes. Keep up the good work, Dave. Thank you, Dave. What a jump start. What, what an amazing turn of events. Had you not heard that and Aqualung had just fluttered out of your life, you may never have been a writer in her and a reviewer and a star giver. For talk oh, tell to me. Stargiver. The most important thing, Stargiver. Yes. Thank you for sharing your jumpstart with us and for that amazing story of Kismet. Absolutely. Lest we think we be done with emails, we've got one more. This is a, a returning writer in her. This is Jimmy James, JJ here. Jim W. writes in with an amazing, mind-blowing uh, moment here. This is entitled, Winding Back to Valhalla. Dear Nick and Omen, I've started dipping into your back catalog as the mood takes me. That's what that tickle was. Loved your minstrel in the gallery section. In particular, you gave my favorite track, Cold Wind to Valhalla, a thorough going over. That's what that tickle was. I wanted to air my knowledge just a bit on this topic. The weird grammar void in the lyrics is Ian's use of the Norse Anglo-Saxon poetic device, Kennings. What? Kennings are word pictures. You probably know that Beowulf has quite a few. Whale Road for Sea, Raven Harvest for Corpse, and others. 
Ian puts his own little spin on it, of course. I love them. Sword snap fright could be a clash of warriors. White pale goodbyes seems like the resulting death of one or both. Mm. Crack wind clatter flash rain bite reminds me of a monumental storm and a cup of silver liquid fire might be tall at the pub after cutting the final track. Hmm. Your minstrel episodes have reignited my love of this album, especially Dee's gorgeous strings and the interlude of Cowbell in Black Satin Dancer. Freaking fantastic. I bought this album on release in 1975, the year I left school, and your mom roams have brought back the memories so vividly. Even had the thrill recently of hearing my 27-year-old son play a damn fine version of Cold Wind on the guitar. Oh, wow. Once more, thanks from an old Tull Skull. P.S. Are you delaying your A coverage until you can find something nice to say about it, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, by the time you hear this, you will know that we've had plenty nice to say about, uh, about A at this point. So one thing that I forgot to mention when we covered Cold Wind of Valhalla, and that I think, honestly, I think Cold Wind is my favorite song off of that album for that reason, those kennings. They, yes. it's, just, it's so evocative to me. We spoke about them, but we didn't know that, that, we didn't know that word and that history. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's super cool. There, it reminds me of, I'm sure you must have seen the old Rankin-Bass Hobbit movie. Oh, sure. Yeah, the, the anime. Yeah, 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 yeah. The original way back in 1977. With music. Does it not have it music? It does. And it reminds me of the song Down Down to Goblin Town. Oh, sure. First of all, Rook sings that song, by the way. Oh, he terrifying. just sings Down Down to Goblin Town over and over, but it's amazing. So maybe, I don't know if that's really Kennings. It's really just like evocative things of like smashing and killing the dwarves. Sure. But it, it always reminds me of that every time I hear that song. Wow, so cool. Yeah, very, very cool. Amazing. Thank you, Jimmy J, for that that knowledge that is super informative. And, and we are super grateful for that. I absolutely love that little tidbit there. Next on the docket, Nick, we have a a positive swarm of new five-star ratings and reviews that have come in. That's right. That is correct because we don't, we couldn't find any reviews, any like official reviews for A. There's no Rolling Stone review for A. So instead of doing one for this album, we figured we'd, we'd drop a bunch right now. Reviews for ourselves. Yeah. Oh yes. This is Talk Tall to Me reviews. Totally 100% selfish. <laughs> Sir, sensors have detected another star in the sky. Dear Lord, that's five stars. Five stars. Five stars. Five stars. Here are the stars I promised you. This show is a fun and in-depth look at a wonderful band. Everyone should listen to Tull and the Feckless Momes. Short and sweet, accompanied by five stars, one of which I've already eaten. That is Aston 42. Don't eat any more. You will ruin your supper. Indeed. Next up from... Smart and entertaining. <laughs> Finally found a show that's a haven for us old school Tull fans. I love the deep dive and smart analysis of both music and especially lyrics. These guys are entertaining. Love the fun facts and theatrical asides. Only problem is it keeps me up at night as I usually use podcasts to put me to sleep, but I'm too interested to tune out. This is a great show, and FYI, I am one of those supposedly rare female Ian Anderson appreciators who also happens to be a feminist and first saw them in concert in 1972. Glad you guys are so dedicated as so many podcasts start and fade out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gehazika Hazika. I hope you, you get some sleep. To get some sleep. And there is still time for us to fade out. And finally, <laughs> one final review from... P space A space P space E from Apple Podcasts, Ireland. It sounds like a grape fell onto the keyboard. <laughs> this is entitled Pure Class, if you're a Jethro Tull fan. Yeah, I'll take it. 
two crazy but intelligent Yanks go song by song through the discography of my all-time favorite band. Loved this band since 1979 when I was 11, 54 now. I was never one for lyric details, so I find it so interesting to listen to their interpretations. They also point out the various instruments at play, which I now listen out for intently. I only started listening on Christmas Day 2021, am now on the last bonus track off Minstrel in the Gallery. Not bad going, as I still play tons of music as well. It's improving episode by episode. I've also played the special Zealot Gene review episode twice to help me get into the long-awaited new 2022 Tull album. Mm. I came on here especially to give them a well-earned positive review, normally listen on Spotify. Hope Apple will let me use that word. (laughs) As an Irish fan, I won't get all their Americanisms or recipes, no problem, that can't be helped. However, I wish they would please ease off on the weekly joke. Tune in next week to listen to our other podcast, Talk Blank to Me. (laughs) Rest assured, we we actually haven't done that in a very long time. It's, It's driving me nuts, he says. In fairness, that's my only negative. I love the show. Looking forward to hearing the next four album reviews. A particularly brilliant period for the band. Good old Catholic Ireland led to my jumpstart in Jethro Tull. I received a few bob at age 11 for my confirmation and promptly bought a tape recorder with a built-in recording mic. Wow. Cutting-edge technology at the time. Also, a few blank cassette tapes. I recorded the albums Aqualung and MU the best of and never looked back. I backed the wrong horse and continued to buy their recordings on cassette until I was 16. (laughs) That's when I bought my first vinyl. At the time, Stormwatch was four pounds and A was 550. I bought the former as it was more affordable. Lucky break. A is definitely my least favorite of their albums, so I can't wait to hear the Feckless Moms slant on it. Maybe they will reinvent it for me. Maybe there's a Mellotron or Cowbell that I missed. Some challenging album reviews to come, but I'm sure they'll be well able for it. I fought hard, but learned to love the 80s, 90s stuff. If introducing someone to the band, I'd never use these albums as good examples, though. Anyway, enough nonsense from me. If you read this Omen or Nick, fair play. You're doing a brilliant job. Keep it up. And that looks like about 20 Irish flags. (laughs) (laughs) Irish flag emojis on there. Thank you so much for writing in. And please tune into our other podcast, (laughs) Irritate Irishman to Me. Wonderful. Next week, first episode, probably last episode. Probably the last episode. (laughs) And... Oh my goodness, that is it for that slew of things. That was a chunk. So that's it for all of that housekeeping. Thank you, everybody, for sitting through that. We greatly appreciate it, and we highly encourage you to write in so we can read yours. But last thing we're going to do, we're going to talk about the song itself of the day, Omen. Which is, of course, Nick. Batteries not included. Batteries not included. June 3rd, 1980. Recorded at Maison Rouge. This is another one of the, the rare ones that it's actually in in the studio. The actual studio, yep. yeah. Four takes were recorded. Take one ended up being the master. Oh, interesting. And it is, in general, just a complaint about kids' toys not being usable out of the box. What a, <laughs> what a dad song to have, Ian. What a dad song. Or is it? Or is it? Maybe it's a kid song. I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> Ooh, Nick. Zing. We've never discussed this song, you and I. That's, well, that's true. Um, Like with most of A, it is not one that we really had a lot of consciousness of when we were in teenagers. Yeah. Yeah, it was at least in college. And by then we didn't stay up all night talking about Tull at that point. We do that now. Yeah. Where does this song fall for you? Uh, let's just let's just go uh, overall A. Yeah, it falls it falls through the crack in my fingers. Yeah, onto the floor. Okay, rolls into a grate. Uh-huh. Goes into the sewer. Uh huh. And uh, from there, terrorizes the local population of the town. Okay, and it, it, it's not worth going to get it again. To going to oh, st- 
God, no. no okay. Once it's once it's escaped, it's very dangerous to follow it. Yeah, you just you just move. You get out of there before. That's the, right. Yeah, okay. And don't tell anyone. Don't tell. Yeah. I we just decided to move today. For this is a, this is a song that I appreciate very very much and don't enjoy listening to, but like wish that I was strong enough to. <laughs> That's a very good way to put it. I think I think I would I. I I could not have put it so eloquently, but I think that's a really a really good way. It, it speaks to how I feel about this song as well. D- does this song do anything for you positively? <sighs> it's very good instrumentally. I really like the scansion. I like how he sings the song. Mm, oh, yeah. I just wish the lyrics were different. I wish the content were different. Oh, really? Yeah. For me, the content is the best... I don't want to see the best part. For me, the the content is sort of the the most palatable part of it. Huh. Okay. Okay. Look at that. For me, listen to that, I, everybody. Look at that. We have different <laughs> opinions. <laughs> For me, the most intense experience of this song is the is the 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 the, the headache inducing yeah. synthesizer. And you know, I know that a lot of people reacted negatively to the introduction of the synthesizer as people have reacted negatively to new technologies being used at various points. Right. I mean, when Bob Dylan plugged in an electric guitar at Woodstock something something, everyone freaked out because they were used to him playing acoustic guitar. Right, right, yeah. People fear change. People fear change, which is kind of silly because change is actually the underpinning experience of the universe. Yeah. So you'd think that people would be used to it, but no, no. apparently not. Yeah. So, I, I, but I, I, the content of the song makes the synth excusable here, though. You know, that's a very good point. That's I do think that they are, theme, and that's this is why I want to like this. I do like this song. I just don't like listening to it. <laughs> in in theory, I like this song. I like that the song exists. Please don't play it. In theory, not in my ears, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love how thematically related it is. I love that that opening riff, that... Yeah. It sounds simultaneously like like losing in a in a 8-bit video game. Yeah. But also it sort of is the sonic representation of a of a toy dying right exactly yeah yeah and all of that all that synthy sound just just embodies and encompasses the sound of like we got 30 new toys for christmas and they all make sound and it's just a cacophony yes exactly exactly that's what i think is also brilliant about the this song is that it is it does sort of take the form of an assault on the senses it does yeah 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 and perhaps an, an assault on one's sensibilities yeah, I, I think I I think this is one of the more offensive, quote unquote offensive synth songs on this album, but it mm. gets away with it because of, of its its context. Now that being said, I don't like the context, therefore I it it just barely gets away with it for me. Now is that because you hate fun? No, it's this is th- I mean, it's clearly, it's well established how much I hate fun, oh, but yes, this is the start. Nick's coming. Put away the fun. <laughs> put away, put away the, the jacks and the, the, the bubbles the, this is, this starts a stint of the second half of this album of subject matter that not only doesn't interest me, it turns me off altogether. I don't Interesting. care about batteries not included. I don't care about uniform and I don't care about four wheel drive. Oh, I love four wheel drive. I know you do. I know you like those songs, but the subject matter is just like, I could care less. But but doesn't it appeal to you in the sense of, of you know, not personally necessarily, but but on a societal level? Does it not have value for you in that in that sense that it's talking about the experience of of this time in history? That it's it's a it's a cultural commentary and a little snapshot in history. Yeah. I mean, I I see that, and I I get that, and I I removed I can appreciate that, but that's not what I want Tull for. I think what I don't I don't need Tull to to comment on that stuff. You know, I need I need broader scopes. I don't need a, a specific thing from Tull. Okay, okay. Unless it's about 
a single weathercock on his barn or... Yeah, I'm going to say that's that's quite specific. I know. I think it's the technological, like the really really modern thing that bothers me the most about those three songs, I think, is how, how really modern they are. Because you... You and it's not that you dislike these songs. You you dislike modernity. That's that's not far from the truth. All right. Yeah. Right. I'll send you a bill. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's just thirty pounds off my shoulders. Thirty pounds out of your wallet. That's it. That, also that zing. I. All of that being said, I can appreciate the song for what it is. You know. Yeah. You can. But you won't. But I won't. I could. I'm physically able to, but mentally not. Let's dive into a little bit of this of this music. Sure. I I wrote Holy Synth Insipid. It's it's. I think Insipid is good. It's it's like saccharinely synth. It reminds me a little bit of the style, of, like the fashion of the '80s, which is mm. which was all that neon polyester. Bright colors, day glow, reflective, sharp angles. Yeah, sharp angles. Yep. I'm thinking of In Living Color. Was oh, that, sure. Was that 90s? Yeah, I think that was. Did that come out of the 90s? Mid- I think 80s? that was this early 80s. I think that was that was mid 80s into early 90s, I believe. 90. It started in 90. Okay. So, so stuff not... carried over. It carried over. I would say it's okay. Well, I think that a lot of the I think that a lot of the, the physical culture of the 80s, you know, fashion, toys cars everything travel was was influenced by the new materials that were being developed and the new sure. manufacturing techniques that were being developed and and accessible at that time you know you had you had to, this rapid development of of plastics that and and the rapid development of manufacturers in asia who could crank some of these things out at scale yeah oh yeah and you you have this technology and and this new resource why not take advantage of it? Because right. because at that time it is the newest thing and it makes life easier. Right. And you know, even something like a color could now be synthesized yeah. at an industrial s- scale, which I mean and and a sound can be synthesized. I mean, it all fits together. It's it's really quite it's a bit horrific. When you, when when you take a step back and, and see see the impact stuff like this has. It's actually really fairly fascinating to think about it like all culturally. Yes, exactly. You have to separate the the cheesiness and the 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 clichés of the 80s but but it's um yeah, it is it is terribly fascinating. So, with all that fascination, Nick, shall we dive into the music itself? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, aside from synth, the the rest of the the instrumentation is very good. You know, when you can hear it, when you can pick it out of the, 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 the miasma. I mean, it's very, the bass is very prominent in here. I was going to say, I think the thing that comes through the clearest for me and the most consistently for me is the bass. And it, it really provides a, a wholesome counterpoint. Yeah. Sonically to the, to the wave of synth, because it's an identifiable, clearly, the hand manipulated instrument, even though it's electric. Yeah. I really like the thing that it, that it does where it's like, <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But th- I mean, that's a good point. Like he's really bending those strings, right? So it's, it's not just a straight up bass line. There is some manipulation that makes it feel a little more electronic. Yes, it fits in. I mean, it's it's all extremely cohesive. That this this song works very very well together. Yeah. And then there's a lot of there's a lot of use of what I think is called dissonance, but I couldn't remember the word, so I wrote disophony. <laughs> Dis- disophony, yeah. Disophony, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Even in in Ian's singing lines, you know, he's singing a note, and the the he's he's got multiple vocal tracks which are slightly off from a harmony, and at the same time the synth is putting this sound across all of which just fails to match up. Yeah, they they grate just enough to to be noticeable but not too much to be excruciating. Depending on depending on your your level of yeah. of ability to listen to it. The synth the synth takes care of the excruciating part. Yeah. But there I mean there are even parts in here where Martin is is 
rocking away. He's got some decent stings. Every now and then he'll come forward. Same thing with Mark Craney's drums. He gets very splashy on the cymbals a little bit later on. And it's very, very proggy. I mean, this yeah. this to me is a great example. Regardless of my personal feelings about this song, this is a wonderful example of prog rock. Mm. Taking an idea and seeing how far can you push it. That's that's actually really valid. And and I think there's a lot of value in this song for that reason. If you can if you can kind of disassociate and be able to, to pick the pieces out and appreciate them for what they're doing uh, on a grander scale altogether to work together. Yeah, I think that's I think that's valid. The riff, the recurring riff that the synth plays, that yeah. regardless of whether you like it or not, that's an amazing riff. It's very cool. It's very, very cool, yeah. It takes a lot of, it takes a lot to come up with that. You know, the music itself is so, it's audacious, I think. Yeah. Much like early pop star in the 80s, Madonna. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's what this song makes me think of, is Madonna. <laughs> well, there was, you know, there was kind of a tendency in the 80s to sort of like push the envelope and, and almost see where is the line? Like, at what point do you start to offend? Sure. That's, yeah. For instance, Madonna, that's what she was all about in the early 80s. You know, the Burning Cross music video and a lot of the outfits and her songs themselves. You know, it's like, how can you, how can you be edgy like that? Taking the name Madonna. Oh, golly, yes. Yeah. I mean, now we take that for granted. Yeah. But at the time, that was, you know, to what's an object you'd find in a church? A cross, a pew, uh, a hymnal. That was that was two pews short of a blasphemy. <laughs> I would I would say I would say one. I mean, it was pretty darn close. I think a lot of people were up in arms about that. Probably. Particularly because, I mean, that was the time, it was the 80s. I mean, everybody was still kind of buttoned up and everything. I mean, of course, you had like the the hippie and the the kind of kind of peace love movement from the 60s into the 70s. But I mean, for the most part, when I think of of culture in the 80s, it's really like it's Ronald Reagan. You know, it's it's yeah. kind of staunch and, and straight. And, and Madonna was one of the first ones to really kind of kind of throw things in there. Tune in yeah. next week for Mumble Madonna to me. <laughs> And then we have this fascinating. We have a we have a a guest vocalist on this track. Nick. That we do. It's Maddie Pryor again. <laughs> oh wow! I, I I thought for a second you were serious. No, no, it's a it's the voice of a little child. That it is. Do you you know who the the voice of the child is? Right. I can make a rather educated guess that it is official friend of the podcast. Too late. He can't take it back. I already have his half of the necklace. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really big necklace because it says official friend of the podcast on it. Yes, huge. James Duncan Anderson, old JDA. James Duncan Anderson. Yeah. As a little boy. He's a, I think he's he's about three, if I remember correctly. He's about three when he when he sang this. Sounds about three. Said this, yeah. He does. He does sound three. Uh, he doesn't currently, present day, sound three. No, 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 no. He sounds like a, like a fully adult male human. Just to clarify, species, age. Nothing Gender. weird <laughs> Not about <laughs> any of this conversation. Where are my batteries? Daddy Wesper, I can't find my batteries. There's a documentary that followed like these eight kids. It started like way early on in like the the, the 80s in England. And they, they oh, oh, I know. I know just what you're talking and they, about. And every 10 years they would check in. Yeah. Me. Ray and I watched, I think, the first one. And we have this running joke where where we quote one of the kids because it was like they followed like really rich like well-off kids and and some not so much to see their trajectory but one of the kids at like age five or something on the video is quoted as saying i like to read the financial times i read observer and the times yeah <laughs> <laughs> and raven and i quote that at to one another probably every month amazing yeah. So, uh, yes. Let's let's jump into to lyrics here. This is this is Ian as 
well, narrating as a small child. This is first person here. Or is it? So this is Ian as a father saying that he is excited about his toys. Is that what you're you're you're, well, you're alluding to? The lyrics are six o'clock in the morning, wake up by the bed, there sits a new Japanese toy, and I like it. Six o'clock in the morning, wake up by the bed, there sits a new Japanese toy. And I like it. Now I think that without further context, that could be said by anyone. That's that's valid. I mean, the next the next verse makes me think younger child if if it's not younger child it's a little creepy but see the name on the wrapping can't read yet but i know it's made for me lucky boy and i want it see the name on the wrapping can't read yet but i know it's meant for me lucky boy and i want it all right perhaps you've got me there but maybe it's like, oh, I haven't put my contacts in. I, I'm not wearing my glasses. I, my eyes are still sleepy, you know? Right. Like, maybe. Lights that flash, wheels that go round, digital display, fresh silicon chips to enjoy, and I need them. Lights that flash, wheels that go round, digital display, fresh silicon chips to enjoy. Do you prefer your silicon chips in guacamole or salsa? Oh, I bake them into pancakes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. They melt a little bit. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Pour some pour some petroleum jelly over top. <laughs> good to go. Oh my God. I think what this is really what this captures for me is that obsession with a new yes. toy. I mean, I was showing you. My doesn't require batteries, but my new, my new, my new obsession, my new fashion piece. And the last time we met, you showed me your robot and your loath cat. So right, exactly. And when you know, when you, when you, when there's something that that taps into that childlike desire, it really is this like I need this thing, or I'm gonna freaking die right now. Yeah, and you just can't stop thinking about it until yes. you until you get it. No doubt, you have the chance to observe this having a child yourself. He's actually pretty good because we keep him bubbled off. I from was everything. talking about myself. <laughs> oh, you? Actually. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say I'm pretty bad about it, but yeah. Yes, I've I've seen it for with, with my with my uh let's see, if you were born when we became friends, you would be t- you'd be twenty one. You'd be my twenty one year old child. Our friendship yeah. is my twenty one year old child. Hey I can finally drink. That's it. That's it. Legally You've been legally doing it for the last seventeen. And then after those three little mini short verses, which as you as you mentioned, the scansion on them is so incredible. Six o'clock in the morning, wake up by the bed. Yeah. Yeah, it's very cool. It's very, very cool. We have the we have the the conflict. Where's the batteries? Where's the batteries? Yeah. Forgive me for, for going overall just yet, but like is this a complaint? Is this like, damn it, now I need batteries for everything? Or is this more like, is this more really just like, this is a, this is a statement. This is life now. Like, we better get used to it. This is the experience that I have with this. I think that given our experience with Jethro Tull up to this point and with the writings and mind of Ian Anderson, rarely is a thing ever a single thing. Well, right. Yes. Yeah. I think that this is an incredibly pithy observation of real life, of the real lived experience of his child getting this new toy, and then probably both of them realizing, oh my <laughs> God, yeah. I have to go and get these batteries, which probably were not as prolific or accessible or inexpensive as they are now. You know, going and getting batteries might have been more of a hassle. Oh, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. And so I think there is that like, this is the thing that I'm observing. I'm observing my child's obsession with this cool new thing that I got them. And I didn't realize because this is the first battery operated toy yeah. that I've ever bought. I didn't realize that you have to buy the freaking batteries for it. But I also think that it is probably more broadly. And thank you for going there. A, a comment 
on the the frustrations with the modernization of life, you know, the technological improvements that we always complain about, you know. Yeah. I updated my operating system and suddenly I wasn't getting alerted about things on my calendar because it has this new focus feature yeah. that automatically turned on and prevented any information to, for, to come to me. And I'm like, thank you so much for updating my system, you piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's Life is getting better, but we make sacrifices to have it be better. You know, like it's it's very peculiar. It's very- or every time that we improve our lives, we also complicate them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And life, life is nothing but complicated now. Exactly. And, you know, and a little bit further on, we have this, this little thing that I love of just like me, perhaps he's hungry. Yeah. Six volts make him smile and 12 volts would probably kill how I like him. Just like me, perhaps he's hungry, six volts. You know, not only do you have to get batteries, you have to get the right kind of battery. Yeah. yeah. That's my favorite verse. I really like that one for some reason. I don't know. There's something. Really? I really like the six volts make him smile and 12 volts would probably kill. For some... That just tickles me for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> well, it's it's like with all of us, you know, if six beers would make me smile, 12 volts or 12 beers would probably kill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's like, yeah, everything has to be calibrated. Sure. I mean, that's that's what I remember about being a kid. I remember having battery operated toys and being and realizing, oh, I need a battery. And my dad would be like, well, here's the box of batteries. Yeah. And I couldn't. And, you know, it was you were always missing one out of the four that you needed of that shape. And part of your mind was like, well, why can't I just stuff these other two in there and maybe it'll work if i if i jimmy up a a paper clip and some aluminum foil to get the two ends to touch it'll be okay right there were a lot of fires in our households 12 volts will probably kill omen (laughs) and then that the final line really like is my big question is mommy daddy can't see you hear you batteries not included in this little boy Is he just playing? Is he just pretending to be a robot? You know, is he like pretending to be his toy? So like Rook does that all the time. Like he'll pretend, sure. you know, so is that all that is? Or is there a deeper commentary there? What do you get out of that? Yeah, I wonder, I'm thinking a lot about the show I'm in, A Clockwork Orange. And one of the central arguments or questions of the show, that the metaphor of the clockwork orange is that an orange is a... Uh, a, a creature capable of growth, imbued with sweetness, you know, dense in flesh, whatever. I forget the exact words because they're not my lines. Um, <laughs> and the the bad guys or the state in the in the story want to tear out the inside of a human being and replace it with clockwork. They want to make a mechanical mm. man that can be governed, essentially. They want to take away the choice between good and evil and and make something predictable, which, of course, c- creates this absurd image of the clockwork orange. It doesn't make any sense. It has it serves no purpose. And it's unnatural. I wonder if there is a sense wrapped up in here, and maybe I'm reading way too far into it, that, that yes, probably the actually what Ian saw was, oh, yes, I'm a little, my, my batteries have run out. You know, the little kid playing that. Yeah. And then Ian extrapolating that and thinking, wow, have have we become so dependent on this technology mm. that our batteries can run out? Whereas you go back a couple albums and, you know, you have the sense of this infinite sources of energy from the forest and the, the lee lines and the, the stars yeah. and everything. And now we've switched to this like, ooh, my battery can run out. Yeah, yeah. Or also to go kind of to the Clockwork Orange thing, like are we – are we just tools for the greater peace and we work ourselves exhausted so our batteries run out every day? For instance, maybe right, think about the people who are cranking out these little toys yeah. in, in sweatshops with no labor protections. Right. Are they not cogs in the orange? We're all cogs in the orange. We're all oranges in the orange factory. Orange-scented cogs. Now, Nick, there is another interpretation of all of this. Okay. 
Give it to me. Which I think I am wrong about. I love I love it when these happen. Go on. And and yet I I remain convinced that there is some justification of this. Okay. Ian has proven himself at various points to be a naughty man. Yes. And can you in good conscience read Ah, my new Japanese toy that I'm so excited about. Oh no, I need batteries. Can you listen to that, Nick? And never once think about a sex toy. Not... I challenge you. Not in 1980. Why do you think not? The first vibrator was invented in the 1800s. Was it battery powered? It was electrically operated. Okay. So as soon as you can put a battery into something, someone will make... A battery-powered sex toy. Okay. I'm going to go to a very dark corner of the internet right Be now. Be careful. Steady. Steady on. And the FBI has seized my assets. <laughs> it's about time. Please seize my asset. <laughs> I mean, I suppose that's a possibility. And I, I mean, you know what? I can't... I, I don't really have anything to argue against it either. Oh my god, in the 1880s, there was one that looked, that kind of operated on the same principle as an egg beater. Oh. Whoa. Beat your eggs. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one was marketed as a blood circulator. Oh, yeah, of course they were, yeah. Here we have 1928, one that uh, is a plug into the wall. Yeah, okay. Yep, yeah. mm-hmm. keeps plugging in, plugging in. Yep, 1980s, the first. In 1983, Japanese sex toy company Vibrotex invented the now iconic sex toy, the rabbit. Well, it would obviously be Vibrotex, right? It depends where you're from. <laughs> anyway, the point being, I can't listen to the song, Nick, without without hearing a little bit of a ton- tongue-in-cheek, naughty facet to it. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to okay. you for your birthday, actually. I'll give you... I'll, t- <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I'm all warmed up. I'll make sure the batteries are not in there when I ship. Yeah. Otherwise, it'll get it'll get sidetracked and they'll think it's a, it's a bomb. Exactly, yeah. Fascinating to note that this frustration about, you know, batteries not being included with, it, with a product has really changed. Nowadays, you know, Apple took advantage of that frustration. They were one of the first companies to start charging their battery-operated products, you know, to a certain extent Mm. before they would pack them. So that when you first got the iPod out of the box in 2020, wait, 2000 and... What? Probably probably early 2000s, right? Like they just came out right as we were just about to get out of high school, I believe. Oh, my God. I do not want to buy an original iPod. Are you sure? $44,000. Are you sure you don't? I am so sure. 2001. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that sounds right. Yep. So when you first got the iPod out of its box in 2001, miraculously, now that we've gotten used to all these years of being like, oh my God, 20 years of, oh my God, I have to find batteries for it. What kind yeah. of battery does it include? Or, or it, it, I mean, it, around that era, at least I have to plug it in for the next four hours before I can use it. Right. Yeah. This was out the box, boom, ready to go. Huh. Yeah. Thanks, Apple. Just like me. Just like you. Boom. And now that's pretty standard. You know, now nowadays when you oh, yeah. get something new, it's usually at least partially charged. Mm-hmm. So you can at least at least get it set up and ready to go. Right. Yeah. Nick, anything else to say about this song? Batteries not included. Did you ever see the the 1987 film Batteries Not Included? No, I never did. What is what is that? Tiny little robot space robots came down and like they just kind of like it's a 1987 American comic science fiction film. It's all these people live in this kind of run down apartment building and it's all sorts of people. And these little these little robot space aliens come down and kind of just like make their lives better. You know, I vaguely remember this. Yeah. And it's it's a comedy, quote unquote, but it's also like it's it's also very sweet. It's like a a, it's not like a wacky comedy, you know. 
Right. I remember it's one of those we we had a bunch of movies on VHS, like recorded off HBO VHS that uh, when we were kids and that we had the batteries not included movies for some reason. Oh, and this was and this was a the whole there was a whole underplot of the developer wanted to tear down the building. Exactly. And yeah. People living there yep. and the little space robots were helping out the little guy. Yep. Yeah. I uh, had Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy, for those of you old enough to know who those people are. Classic, like old, old actors at the time. They were old in 1987. So just, yeah, I remember that from my childhood. That's all. Next week, Omen. <sighs> you startled me. <laughs> Next week, do you know what co- what's coming up? After batteries not included? The batteries of my knowledge have just run out. All right. What are we listening to next week? Uniform. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. One that I'm not super familiar with. I'm I'm trying to s- stay in my seat while we get close to four-wheel drive. <laughs> I want to leap ahead. I know. You're so excited for four-wheel drive. We'll drive. Until next week, you can recharge the batteries of our toydom with five volts. All you need is five volts. A single, five single star volts. <laughs> five single volt stars that you can plug right into our back, and we will. Keep making this podcast. That was very good, Nick. Uh, that was that was that came from inside of me. You can breathe <laughs> life into us by buying merch or spending that money on a Patreon subscription, where you will get two additional podcasts a month: Outtake Tall to Me and Feckless. And access to our Discord, where we have some amazing discussions with some amazing people. You, too, can be an amazing person in our Discord. It's like being shipped off to the island of discarded toys and finally finding your community. Until next week, I am the lucky boy, Nick McGill. I am the fresh silicon chip, Omen Sade. We are the mysterious vibrating box, the feckless momes. And this is Talk Tall to Me, and I like it. Talk Tall to Me is a proud member of the Feckless Gnomes Audio Network. Oh God, my batteries. Where are they? Mommy. <laughs>